Let us pray. We bless your name for how you have ministered to us from the very first night until this time. We bless your name for all your faithful ministers whom you have given your word to give unto us. Thank you, Lord, for the challenges, for the inspiration. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the instruction, the teaching we have received as we have opened ourselves to what you have sent to us from your servants. Lord, we pray that all we have learned, all we have written down, all we have prayed about will remain with us till that final day in Jesus' name. We thank you for the various workshops and how you laid line upon line, showing us the path of wisdom, giving the tools into our hands, showing us how to be successful in your own way and how to have excellence in ministry, how to do that which pleases you and how to so work and so labor to bring people into the kingdom of God. All these things that we have learned, Father, we pray, it will be of great assistance to us as we go back to our local churches, go back to our nations, go back to our local government areas, our regions, our states, in Jesus' name. We bless your name for our children that early in life, they have surrendered their lives to you to be born again. And they know that it is this old time religion that will take us to heaven. Therefore, Lord, we pray for these children that as they have challenged us, you will keep them in the faith. So that as they grow up, if Jesus tarries, as they have been used of God here, you will continue to use them in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for our members of the adult choir. Thank you for their sacrifice, for their dedication. Thank you, Lord, for yielding their lives unto you. And definitely they have ministered unto us. And we pray that the messages we have heard through them will be written indelibly upon our hearts in Jesus' name. And as we recollect the songs they rendered, or as we listen to them over again in cassettes in our own homes, the ministration we have got, the inspiration we have got, as a result of their singing, will continue with us in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for all our workers who have taken this whole week off just to come and serve us, those who have worked in various areas, various places, to minister to our convenience in a physical way. Father, we pray that this week they have given to serve the servants of God. They will not lose their reward in Jesus' name. As we come before you now to look at your word. Father, we pray that your truth will be made plain and clear to every one of us once again in Jesus name we bless your name for our fellowship together we bless your name for our unity here together we bless your name for how you have done all things well father we pray that the same fellowship we have got here will continue in the spirit even when we are physically separated from one another in jesus name let your hand be upon us let your truth be within us so that wherever you want us to minister wherever you have placed us will continue to be faithful unto you we thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray from Proverbs chapter 22, we're looking at verse 28. Proverbs 22, 
Verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have said. As we bring the Congress to a conclusion, I want to look at the old landmarks in modern times. The old landmarks in modern times. Here we have read in Proverbs 22 and verse 28, telling us and instructing us, commanding us, that we should not remove the old, the ancient landmarks, which thy fathers have said. Landmarks were very important in Israel, and landmarks are very important in every nation. For those who possess land today, they know the importance of landmarks to demarcate their own part of the land of the property and removing those landmarks especially when it is government landmark or the king's landmark to demarcate or to identify the king's property removing the landmarks can be a very serious matter and there are landmarks in the word of god removing those landmarks too in the word of God, the landmark set by God can be a very serious matter. We have doctrines of God's word which act as landmarks and they remain unchanged. God set them. We must not change them. We must not try to replace them with modern popular thoughts. Because God says to the modern man, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That's why we're told in verse 21 of Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs 24, 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. We who are servants of God, we shall fear the Lord. We who are servants of the Lord shall honor and respect the laws of God, exalt, uphold, the word of God and in your villages and in your cities you may find the people that are given to change the people that feel that they need new doctrine new philosophy new ideology and they want to change the word of God remember that these are ancient landmarks that God himself has said meddle not with them that are given to change. Cooperate not with them that are given to change. Associate not with them that are given to change. Do not support, do not help, do not fellowship with the people that are given to change because the word of God is so serious and we need to keep to the word of God. In First Timothy chapter 4, First Timothy chapter 4, from verse 15 and verse 16, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Your salvation is at stake. Your relationship with God, your fellowship with God is at stake. Your entrance to heaven 
is at stake and your benefit on high is at stake your reward in heaven at stake if you are given to change if you tamper with the ancient the old landmarks that god himself has set take it unto thyself the temptation will come when you see people that tamper with the doctrines of the bible to make their congregations grow large the temptation will come to you too maybe if i change the doctrine a little make it easier for people to believe and to accept without praying much and without the grace of god the temptation will come to you that in order to have quick results expanded church program and respect in your countries where you have come from acceptance by religious bodies religious associations denominations around you that if i'm going to have acceptance by all these other religious people i better do something and tone down a little bit and change a little bit and modify a little bit that temptation will be there the temptation will be there when you see some people in your own church in your membership that you love so dearly and that you have come to fellowship with over the years and some of these people come to you and say i think i'll have to leave this local church and you say why and it says i agree with everything except this the temptation will come in order to keep this friendly wonderful member of your church who has been confused by the devil in order to keep him the temptation might come that to change the word of god a little be accommodating the devil will say be tolerant the devil will say and even counselors will tell you that maybe you have to apply some beads of wisdom at such a time of temptation take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee let's consider three points point one old landmarks of bible days we need to look at the word of god and see the ancient landmarks the old landmarks of bible days point two deception in modern times deception in modern times point three faithfulness to the gospel landmarks faithfulness to the gospel landmarks point one old landmarks of bible days in deuteronomy chapter 4 deuteronomy chapter 4 reading from verse 2 to verse 5 ye shall not add unto the word which i command you neither shall ye diminish aught from it that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal For all the men that followed Baal the Lord thy God has destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God, are alive every one of you this day behold i have taught you statutes and judgments even as the lord my god commanded me that ye should do so in the land whether ye go to possess it here moses a great man of god chosen of god for the children of israel to teach them, to lead them, 
to show what to believe. He knew that he would not be going with them into the land of Canaan. But then, even though he will be absent, the word will be present. And he reminded them that they have been taught statutes, commandments, judgments, ordinances. What the New Testament will emphasize as doctrines is being given to them. And he said, you are going to the land. As you go to the land, don't forget our past history. That there have been those among us, he said, that followed Baal Peor. And God destroyed them. Therefore, as you go to the land, he said, make sure that you keep to the word of God you have been taught. He said, all he gave to them, God gave unto him. The same thing as we're going back home. It will not be possible that all our preachers who have preached here will follow you to your location. It will not be possible that all our workshop leaders and teachers will follow you to your location. And even though we who have ministered to you may not follow you to your location, we have given you the word of God. And that word of God you have received is what you will keep to. Even though you are there in that village, you are there in that town, you are there in that local government area or wherever you find yourself, you will make sure that you keep to the word of God. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, Many years had passed now, and the children of Israel had gone from generation to generation, and in fact, hundreds of years have gone by. And Jeremiah wanted to remind the children of Israel that what is still important is still the old landmarks, the old teachings, the word of God they had learned. Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Ye shall find rest for your soul. The secret of rest, the secret of faith, the secret of walking with God, the secret of the power of God and the hand of God walking with us is to remain in this old path, in the old way, the good way, and to walk therein. We will not find rest just because we import gimmicks from abroad. We import some methodologies from abroad. That will not give us rest. What will give us rest and blessing upon our ministry is that we keep to the teaching of the word of God. Ye shall find rest for your souls. God established the old landmarks through his prophets in the Old Testament. His word was binding on all the people, all the princes and their kings. God's word could not be changed because he said, I am God, I change not. What we discover in the Bible is that even the prophets that God used to deliver the messages to the children of Israel, those landmarks, if they themselves, if they changed the word of God, that God had sent through them, immediately they became false prophets. And you will see that even when they changed in a minor way, the things they had said, the things they had taught, the things they had given by revelation, if they changed it in any way for any reason, they themselves suffered from the hands of the Lord terrible judgments. You remember the young prophet, that man of God in First Kings, chapter 13, especially from verse 14 to verse 22. You will see that he had upheld the word of God. He had done the will of God in the place God sent him. But an old prophet, and those old prophets are many today, 
in various denominations, in various evangelical Christian associations, in various Christian bodies. It may be ecumenical. It may even be Pentecostal. It may be, um, it may be evangelical. These old prophets are many. And the old prophets are always there in every town, in every city, in every community, in every province, in every nation. And these old prophets are quick to say that they recognize your ministry. And if you will associate with them, it will give you publicity. It will give you real uh, acceptance with the people because they are the resident old old uh, people over there and because of that you change you remember that young prophet he said the lord has told me not to go back and not to do that the old prophet said an angel appeared unto him but he lied it's not all the testimonies we hear from gray-headed old prophets that are true it is not all all testimonies we hear from associations of evangelicals, associations of Pentecostals, ecumenical bodies. It is not everything they say that is from God. And if because of what the ecumenicals say, and what the evangelicals say, and what the Pentecostals say, and what the associations say, and what the fraternities say, you change the word of God. You see, that young prophet died prematurely died prematurely and was killed torn apart by lions in due time god after sending these prophets in the old testament to give unto the children of israel the old landmarks in due time he sent jesus christ to redeem us from our sins and to re-establish the landmarks set by God for all time and for all ages. And God had given the impression before. He had told the children of Israel that the time was coming. That he will send a prophet unto them. A prophet with a capital P. A prophet above all the other prophets. A prophet that is greater than Moses and greater than Isaiah, and greater than Ezekiel, that he will send that prophet to them. And all the prophets from Samuel, and from Isaiah, from Ezekiel, and from Jeremiah, all those prophets were looking to the time when the greatest of all prophets will come. Eventually, Jesus came. And we're told in Acts chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you and it shall come to pass that every soul every soul in whatever denomination in whatever evangelical ecumenical or pentecostal assembly every soul which will not hear him shall be destroyed from among the people this is what God had said concerning Jesus Christ. And it was fulfilled in the New Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 18. The promise had been, I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command you. And Jesus Christ came to establish that. He came to give. The landmarks that will not change until the end of the church age. Everything that Jesus emphasized is not part of the old covenant that is going to be abolished. The old covenant is abolished already. The ceremonial laws and all those things in the Old Testament and the killing of rams and the killing of doves and the sprinkling of blood and the washing with this and the hyssop and everything and the labor and the tabernacle, all that has been fulfilled. And because that has been fulfilled in Christ, all that has been abolished. But then Christ came to emphasize the one that cannot be abolished. 
the one can, that cannot be modified, the one that cannot be changed. And he gave us the word. And then he tells us in Matthew chapter 28, from verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. He says, as you go, you teach all nations. And it is not different nation, different doctrine. It is not different local government area, different doctrine. As you disciples of Christ go into all nations, you teach the same thing. You emphasize the same thing. These are the ancient, the old landmarks that cannot be changed. He said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The form of baptism is the, should be the same in all nations. And the way we prepare them for water baptism should be the same in all nations. The fact that infants, babies cannot be baptized. The fact that they have to repent and believe the gospel first before they are baptized in all nations. The fact that there should be an evidence they are believed on the Lord Jesus Christ before they are baptized in all nations. The fact that, that it, it is not that water baptism saving them. It is the outward symbol, evidence that the person carries out the command of God because he had been born again. And you don't baptize in the name of Jesus only. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then it says, in all those nations, teaching them, teaching them, teaching them. Our churches are not for entertainment. Teaching them. Our churches are not just to arouse the emotions of people. Teaching them. Our churches are not just to make people clap. Teaching them. Our churches are not to make people rejoice and just sing well. Teaching them. Our churches are not for ceremonies. Teaching them. Our churches are not just for programs without teaching, without instruction. Teaching them. That is what the church of Jesus Christ is all about. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Christ has said and has re-established the unchangeable landmarks. He said we should teach all things whatsoever. All things whatsoever, all things whatsoever he has commanded, whatever misguided and misinformed preachers do, that should settle this great commission we have read, should settle what we who are here, what we are to do. What Christ said is fixed, it's unmovable, it's unchangeable. God spoke it to him, and he taught it, and it is fixed. And we are to teach others what Jesus taught. And those who hear us, in turn, are to take the same responsibility and teach others the same thing. We find important landmarks in what Jesus taught. Because since he said that we go and teach all things whatsoever he has commanded, we know then that what he taught has become for the church the old landmarks established more than 1900 years ago now. And yet it is for the modern church. It is for the modern preacher. It is for the preachers of today because it is unto the end of the age, the end of the world. What important landmarks do we find in the message of Jesus? One, we find repentance. And he said, teach it. We find entrance into the kingdom. He said, strive, agonize to enter into the kingdom. Press in into the narrow gate. That's what we find. He didn't teach raising up your hand so you can be born again. He didn't teach smile into the kingdom of God. He taught there should be sorrow for sin. There should be mourning for sin. There should be agonizing. 
There should be seeing the kingdom of God and entering and taking the kingdom of God by violence. He meant that you will cut off any hindrance that will stop you from getting into the kingdom of God. And it is only the people that strive, agonize, pray, repent, turn away from sin. And they press into the kingdom. Those are the people that get saved. What are the landmarks? Jesus taught seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. Jesus placed salvation and Christian living above healing, above casting out devils, above prophecy, above a lot of things that people are interested in today. He said, you seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. He taught the life of discipleship, the life of love, the life of self-denial. He emphasized bearing the cross. In fact, he said, anyone that follows him, if he does not bear the cross, is not worthy to be his disciple. Jesus Christ taught humility. He taught it directly. He taught it by illustration. He taught it by his very life. And then he finalized it by saying, Except ye be converted and become as humble as this little child, you will not get into the kingdom of God. He taught sanctification. He taught baptism in the Holy Spirit. Jesus emphasized evangelism. The harvest truly really is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Do not say there are yet four months and then comment the harvest. Behold, the field is white for harvest already. He taught missions. He said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations. He taught seeking the lost. I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. And immediately he said that he told us a parable that he gave the talents to his servants. Go and get occupied until I come. He taught the necessity of preaching the gospel in all nations. Those are the landmarks they laid down for us. He taught overcoming temptation. He taught enduring persecution. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. He taught praying for our persecutors. And he said, we should love. We should bless. We should pray for the people that persecute us. He taught loving God supremely. Because he said... That if you love father or mother or child or wife or husband or anyone above him, you are not worthy to be his disciple. He taught that we should love God supremely. He taught loving believers sincerely. He taught obeying the word of God uncompromisingly. Those are the old landmarks that Jesus said. Then he taught the necessity of living in holiness except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven he taught freedom from sin he said he that committed sin is the servant of sin and of the devil but he said if the son shall set you free ye shall be free indeed and he taught that we should be free from adultery from hypocrisy, from anger. In fact, he said, if you are angry, or you say thou fool or racker, you are already in danger of hellfire. He thought that we should be free from blasphemy, from covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the sin that he possesses. He thought that we should be free from pride, because he said, all these things, including falsehood and pride, come from within and they defile the man. He thought that we should be free from seeking the praise of men. Because he told the people, how, shall, how will you believe the people that seek praise and glory and honor from one another? And you do not seek that glory that comes from God alone. He thought that we should be free from worry and anxiety. These are the landmarks. He said, take no thought for your life. What you will wear, what you will eat, what you will put on, is not the life more than raiment. Behold, the birds of the air, they spin not, they toil not. And yet I say unto you, God provides for them. And if God has provided for all this, how much more will he provide for you, ye of little faith? He thought that we should be free from the love of mammon. 
the love of money. He said you cannot serve God and mammon, that you will either choose one and reject hate the other, or else you will cleave to one and then you will, uh, you will oppose the other. He said that we should lay our treasure in heaven because where your treasure is there your heart will be also he thought that we should be free from worldly pleasure we should be free from evil speaking because he said that every evil thing that man shall say he shall give account thereof in the day of judgment important landmarks that christ himself has said and that we ourselves need to preach constantly and consistently these are important landmarks set by Jesus. Go over again. He taught on the new birth. He must be born again. He taught on receiving eternal life. He taught on salvation. He taught on Christian perfection and heart purity. Be ye therefore in heart, baptism in the Holy Ghost with power from on high. Because he said, this power you are going to receive is the power from on high, the promise of the Father. He taught on casting out devils, he taught on healing. As you go preach the gospel, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils, heal the sick, and raise the dead. He taught on faith and the authority of the believer. He taught on the necessity of having faith. He said, have faith in God. Then he tells us that verily I say unto you, that whosoever, if you believe and you say it with your mouth according to the word of God, it will be established. And he taught on prayer. He taught on fasting. He taught on marriage. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. He taught on water baptism. He taught on the Lord's Supper. He taught on bringing little children to Christ and not forbidding them because of such is the kingdom of God. He taught on obedience to the commandments of God. He taught on restitution. He taught on the necessity of faithfulness and endurance to the end. He taught on forgiveness, forgiving those who offend you 70 times, 7 times. He taught on bearing fruit, producing good works to glorify your God, your Father who is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus Christ taught on gentleness, harmlessness, meekness, and humility. He taught on feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the prisoners, showing mercy to the needy. Jesus Christ taught on resurrection. He taught on the rapture. He taught on the great tribulation. He taught on his second coming. He taught on rewards in heaven for faithful believers. He taught on eternal punishment in hell for sinners. And so we should understand that Jesus Christ has already laid the foundation. He has given us the landmarks. And he says, go ye therefore into all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then he tells us, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Jesus taught that scripture is infallible. Jesus emphasized that the word of God is unchangeable. In fact, he said, scripture cannot be broken. And it is the way he believed the scriptures emphasize the scriptures in the same way we are to go in all our locations in all our churches and establish the unchanging word of god and make the bible the scripture that jesus said cannot be broken make that the center of our worship the center of our fellowship the center of our teaching the center of our activities the center of everything that we do in the church because if we don't, we will not be doing what Christ has said. Jesus said we should reject all traditions of men that make the word of God of none effect. And so, since this is the word of God, and these are the ancient landmarks established for the church, by the head of the church himself, by Jesus Christ, we should not meddle with the people that are given to change. The people that preach one doctrine in January, another doctrine in March. They preach one doctrine in February. By the time it is September, it is another doctrine. 
Let us keep to this unchanging, infallible word of God. Let's see what the Lord has to say concerning his word. In Psalm 119, reading from verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. Not just for 20 years, 73 to 93. Forever. We cannot begin to say now that, well, since we've got little experience now, we don't have more experience than the Holy Ghost, more understanding than the Holy Ghost, more understanding than God. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, and let it be settled in your heart, settled in your ministry, and do not be changing, modifying the word, tampering with the word of God, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Let it be so in your village, in your local church, in your region, in your state, in your nation, that the word of God is established and it will stand forever. In First Peter chapter 1, Verse 24 and verse 25. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. The word of the Lord endureth forever. And then Peter says, And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. That is the word that has been preached in the New Testament. And you know the New Testament emphasized the Old Testament. The New Testament upheld the totality, the completeness of the Old Testament. The New Testament never said, well, that one was said by Moses. That one, it was Joshua that did it. That one, that was David, and that's not important. The New Testament emphasized the Old Testament and then emphasized the words of Christ. And the words of Christ emphasize everything that had been the revelation of the Father. It says, this is the word, the word that shall stand forever, the word that will not be changed, the word that will not be modified. This is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. In 2 Peter chapter, two, chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 19. We have also a most sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first. That no prophecy of, of the scripture is of any private interpretation. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. The interpretation of the word of God is clear. If the interpretation is correct, it will get you saved. If the interpretation is correct, it will make people to hate sin. If the interpretation is correct, it will make the people to love righteousness and holiness. If the interpretation is correct, the interpretation will prepare you to suffer persecution. If the interpretation is correct, that interpretation will make you to resist the devil and to overcome temptation. If the interpretation gives allowance for sin, it is wrong interpretation. If the interpretation modifies it a little and excuses sin, tolerates sin, it is wrong interpretation. It is a private interpretation to justify the weakness of that preacher, to justify all the, all the ideologies that he has brought from abroad. If the interpretation is excusing sin, it is because there is sin in his own life or sin in some places that he doesn't want to confront. Because of that, you'll say, well, actually, you know, this is the way we used to interpret it. And, uh, you know, because that time, 
it was holiness in the day holiness and the night holiness every morning that is the interpretation of the holiness people but actually now if uh, since we know that what is important is to be able to build up ourselves and you know to have courage and not to discourage people and not to make people people feel bad not to make people cry cry and cry saying that they are looking for heaven not to make people feel that maybe they are not living right just to make them know that we are all the children of God and there's joy and blessing and prosperity for every child of God let's drop the interpretation of the holiness people this is now the new interpretation that's private as private and that's the reason why you are proclaiming or wanting that private interpretation but it says knowing this that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man but holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy ghost in revelation chapter 22 revelation chapter 22 reading from verse 18 and from verse 19 for i testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book if any man shall add unto these things god shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy god shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book so then the lord wants us to keep to these old landmarks unfortunately there is deception in the world in the church world in the denominational world there is deception among so-called christians but this doesn't come to bible believers as a surprise at all because the lord himself had said that such falsehood deception will come and as you see that that should make you to have more confidence in the word of god point two deception in modern times Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 and verse 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise. And shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, what does it mean? He that shall endure unto the end. Well, you know, he's been talking of the false prophets, he's been talking of false teaching. It's been talking of the fact that many will be deceived into error. Many will be deceived into false doctrine. But now he says, he that shall endure, that is, he that shall remain with the truth, remain in sound doctrine, remain in all the things Christ has given to us, even though it may look like a lonely road you are walking. Because many preachers and many so-called ministers around you have changed have deviated many of them have been deceived it says when others are deceived and the love of many is waxing cold because of the abundance of iniquity it says he that shall endure to the end you remain in that salvation in experience and in doctrine you remain in that sanctification in experience and in doctrine you remain in that baptism in the Holy Ghost in experience and in doctrine. You remain in the self-denial. You remain in the holiness of life in experience and in doctrine. You are teaching other people. It says, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. In verse 24 and verse 25. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. 
and shall show great signs and wonders. Now there are people that have a kind of logic. They say, look at this miracle. If God were not with me, if you say that my interpretation of scripture is not correct, how about this miracle? How about this sign? How about this wonder? How about this prophecy we gave last month and the people of the church they discovered it was true to detail? How about the things uh, we proclaim in dream to so and so? And we have come, he has come over here to our pupil to testify that what so and so told me is exactly the same thing. How about all those prophecies? How about all those miracles? How about those signs and wonders? If you say that our interpretation of the word is not correct, if you say that we are false prophets, how about the provision of God? How about the prosperity? You say that this sin is not true. Look at what God has provided for us. Look at that verse 24. And these are the words of Jesus Christ. You don't judge the ministry on the basis of the sick getting healed, demons being cast out, signs and waters are taking place, prosperity is there, things are multiplying. You judge on the basis of upholding the totality of the word of God. If you see a preacher, if you see a church, where the totality of the word of God is not upheld, all those miracles and signs and wonders are very, very deceptive. Look at it, verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great, not small, not ordinary, not even moderate miracles. Great, extraordinary. The one that will surprise you and make you to feel, well, I think my need is going to be satisfied in that assembly. They will show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. It says, if it were possible, the very elect will open their mouth like this and say, we have doctrine, <laughs> but look at the fantastic miracle in this other place. If it were possible, the elect of God, the people of God will say, it's true we have holiness, it's true we have sanctification, but look at the problems we have in our, in our church, in our assembly, and yet uh, we don't see the, the kind of spectacular miracle. If they say that God is not with these people, how about this sign, how about this wonder, how about this miracle? If it were possible, they will deceive the very elect. And then verse 25, Jesus said, behold, was talking to his people, behold, I have told you before. And behold, you have now known. If you go back and you exalt miracle above repentance, healing above holiness of life, if you are running after uh, miracle workers, those who are coming to every village and every town, and as they come, they say, let us all get together. And, uh, you know, there's that association of ministers. And say, bring all the deeper life choir. Bring all the other church choirs. Bring all the counselors. Bring everybody. And you say, how about this man? Is he a true man? Is he a real man of God? Oh, they say, well, uh, miracles prove that he's a man of God. In his last crusade, the dead was raised. In his last crusade, lepers were cleansed. In his last crusade, goiters went up. In his last crusade, this happened and this happened. You don't ask for any other thing. Once they have told you that miracles follow after his ministry, finish. You bring all the church members. And it is in your local deeper life church, they are even going to have the ministerial preparation for that crusade. Only to get to that crusade and see that man tear down the doctrine of Christ on restitution. See that man tear down the doctrine of Christ on having to repent and believe on the Lord. Then all your church members are there. All your workers are there. And immediately um, after tearing down everything, then at the end of it, it begins to talk about miracles. And then the people get healed. And your church members open their mouth like this. They cannot close it. They say, our pastor doesn't have this miracle. Only holiness all the time. Consecration all the time submission all the time and then if you wants to establish a new church there all your members they go there they may be coming to your church you know once in a while still because of the attachment but when they are really looking for meeting their need that is where they go if it were possible jesus said that these false prophets with their great signs and wonders they will deceive the very elect. And then Jesus could have stopped there and then go his way. Then he said, behold, 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 I told you before. 
So if you have swept, if you are swept away by the deception, by the lies of all these kind of wonders, you will not say you have not heard. Jesus said, Behold, I told you before. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you see, why will God allow this? Why will God allow the false prophets, the false preachers, the people that perpetrate false doctrine, why will he allow them to be successful? Why will he allow them to be carrying on? Verse 19 tells you the reason. It is for you to understand the people that are really standing. It is a test for you. It is a temptation that God has allowed so that your own heart can be proved. Look at it, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. There will be heresies. There will be false doctrine. There will be deviation from the truth. There will be tampering with the word of God. Why will God allow that? So that if you are really a approved person of God, you'll be made manifest by your standing, by your taking your stand saying, even if I am going to die in sickness, I will not allow a false prophet to lay hands upon me so that, uh, you know, he will heal me with his whatever spirit he's operating from. It is to make you understand, even if it will take me one year praying on my own to get baptized in the Holy Ghost, kneeling down, consecrating, praying, doing whatever I can do, I will go through that long journey to get baptized in the Holy Ghost rather than go to a fellowship where they don't emphasize sanctification or holiness and allow them to minister to me and lay hands upon me to receive a kind of spirit. It means that you are going to say, whether even if I don't have a child now, if it will take me the next five years, the next seven years, before I have a child, I will rather stay. I will rather wait upon the word of God, rather than go to and have semi-evangelical, semi-Pentecostal, semi-truthful, se false in one way and uh, true in the other way, rather than going to such people so that they will pray for me to have a child. I will rather suffer. I'd rather have the poverty, the joblessness. I'd rather remain where I am. They may say that, well, in this place, the disciplined people and all that, and maybe I'm under discipline. I'd rather remain here. Let the righteous man smite me. It shall be ointment upon my head. I would rather remain here and get to heaven than go to a place where immediately I get there, they will not even ask where you're coming from. And what problem did you have in your local church where you're coming from? Immediately they're going to make you a pastor immediately they are going to make you a bishop i would rather stay here and suffer with the people of god for a season for a while so that i'll be able to get to heaven and go to a place where they will exalt me and exalt me into perdition you see it is the heresy it is a false teaching that comes all along the way you stand will show whether you are approved of god if you are not able to stand and you are following the winds that blow then it means that you are really not approved of god in second peter chapter 2 second peter chapter 2 from verse 1 but there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately privily shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction it says there shall be false prophets also among you also among the people among you there will be false prophets and here is what here is what paul himself spoke about he gathered the elders of the Ephesian church together. And he said, you remember, for these three years I've labored among you with tears. Then he said, because I know that after my departure, false prophets will arise among you to take disciples after them. If you're a real pastor in a real church, a church like yours, you do not call outside preachers to come in and take your pulpit and say, well, we are the same. How do you know you are the same? You know his heart? You know his background? You know his intention? You know his motive? You know his plan? You know whether God accepts him or rejects him? You know his private, immoral life? How do you say you are the same? Then you say we are the same. And you hand over your congregation. 
unto such a pastor. And when you hand over the congregation to him, unfortunately, you don't even sit down to listen to what he's saying. You as a pastor, you just rise up and you are doing other physical things. You are doing this. You are repairing generator. You are doing this. Didn't you see at this meeting? When the generator was off, I didn't leave this place. That's not my work. It says, it is not meat. For us to leave the word of God and to serve tables. Therefore, choose among yourselves seven men of honest report that have faith. The people that have the spirit of God who will be in charge of this work. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the world. When the generator broke down, I didn't leave this place. This is my own part. The generator is their part. They work in the kitchen. We have faithful people there. That's their part. The people, the hostel, that's their part. You as the pastor, as the teacher, you sit there, you listen to what anybody is preaching. Don't you see during this meeting, I trust our people. These are ministers that I know. The preachers are preaching. I've listened to them. I don't know how many times. And by the grace of God, up to this point, I know what they have been teaching. And yet, when they were preaching, was I, well, did I live here? Saying, well, you know, uh, those are our people. Oh, yes, they are our people. I know by the grace of God, they are even going to tell the truth. But I sat tight. I sat here and looked at every reference and looked at every word. That is your responsibility. In a retreat, messages are going on. Another person is preaching and you are here and there. How do you know what they are teaching? How do you know as the overseer? National overseer, state overseer, region overseer. How do you know that the people preaching are emphasizing it, laying it line upon line, line precept upon precept? You will supervise, you will listen, and if anything goes wrong, you will immediately correct because there shall be false teachers, false prophets among you. Not only that, if there is question time, how could you have question time in the church? And then you are not there to listen to the answers they are giving. God has given you responsibility. What if some of those young men that are answering the question, what if they say some of the things they have read recently in some books? And uh, you know, it is very, very important. And you as children of God, as the people that are committed to the old landmarks, the people that are committed to the doctrines of the Bible. Whenever the preaching of the word of God is going on in your church, you listen to every sentence, every word, everything that is said. You are not, you will not be sleeping as the leader. You see, if you are going to do that, you are going to really reorganize yourself, reorganize your time and delegate. Delegate the other things that can be done to other people. Let that person do this. Let that person do that. Let that person do the other thing. And then the real thing. The climax, the one that if anything is wrong in the kitchen, maybe about the food that is not sweet enough, we can take care, they can take care of that. But this one, if this one goes wrong, everything goes wrong. If this one goes wrong, everything goes down the drain. Look at it again, Second Peter chapter 2 from verse 1. And there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, if you don't supervise, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and shall bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, many, many shall follow their pernicious ways. You say, well, our people are so taught that I believe that there's no danger, there's no harm. Nobody will be deceived. Well, the Bible says many. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. All these preachers that, you know, emphasize false doctrine, get the churches together, get this one together, and they want your cooperation. Most of the time, they're looking for how to feed their belly. They make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time uh, lingereth not, and their damnations lumbereth not. We live in a day when people call evil good, and they call good evil. The reprobate mind says, something is right when god says it's all wrong and you see someone may try to destroy a landmark and make you think a black is white 
and at white is black. But God will judge all unrighteousness. Satan appears as an angel of light. Infidelity often comes under an appealing cloak with an attractive title. You see, there are false doctrines that come under a good title. And if the people, if uh, you know, the people presenting the false doctrine are very clever in the use of language, and they are very clever in making you in appealing to your felt needs. Already you, when he begins to talk and he's appealing to your felt needs and says, God is great, God is mighty, Jesus is powerful, he can do all things, nothing is impossible for God. You know, it begins with those wonderful good things. If you are here today and you are sick, it will heal you. You don't know what he's going to say next. Already you are clapping. Already you are jumping. Already you are saying, praise the Lord. This is going to be a wonderful day. In the midst of the clapping, in the midst of the rejoicing, in the midst of the excitement. Then he brings in cleverly what he wanted to bring in because of the state in which you are. The clapping and the rejoicing and the excitement. You don't know when you are already swallowing error. And even after that, even when he says the wrong thing, because he happens to be a person that knows how to talk, a person that knows how to present his ideas, and you're already rejoicing, just say, that one is not important, he's an interesting preacher. That one doesn't matter, he's an interesting preacher. And the way he, you know, makes the people to just rise up and raise your hand in the air and sing beautiful crosses and everything, already you're taking everything, and then right Unlike that, you call evil good, you call good evil. And you go into error. That's why a child of God, if you get into a place, you shouldn't get there, but if you happen to get to a place where somebody is preaching, the shouting is going on, the excitement is there, the preacher is very interesting, you don't shout with them. You open your eyes, you open your ears, you open your Bible, and all the things you learned before, you bring it near you. And you watch very well so that you just don't shout with the people and get excited with the people and then when it brings in error you will not be able to tell so that's why we need to be very careful because satan appears as an angel of light and because he does that false prophets they deceive many by the millions plunging souls into a lost eternity god needs a multitude of fearless preachers who will not shun to declare the whole counsel of God. The Bible wants the Christian against preachers whose teachings are contrary to the doctrine of Christ. It tells us in Romans chapter 16 what our responsibility is. You find false preacher, you find a false teacher, you find false doctrine, no matter where, no matter who. Might even be something that you had appreciated in the past. But now, he has been given to change. You don't meddle with such people. You don't associate with those people. Before those people get into those errors, yes, they have made up their minds. And they have known how to twist this a little, change that a little, adjust that a little, join everything together like a string. They know how to give it to you and how to deceive you. And therefore, you have to be very, very careful. In Romans chapter 16, verse 17, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines which ye have learned and avoid them. Mark them and avoid them. The temptation will come to go and listen to him. The temptation will come to just, well, I just want to go and listen. I want to hear what he has to say. I want to know the reason why he changed. I want to know the reason why he doesn't believe in this sound doctrine anymore. I want to know the reason why he prefers now to be teaching what he's teaching. Maybe he's right. The moment you begin to say, maybe somebody different from what you have learned in the word of God. Maybe he's right. Already you are going astray. It is very dangerous to tamper with God's word. To alter, to add to it, or to take away from it. The eternal truths found in God's book remain ever the same, unchangeable, infallible. Anyone who tries to reject or remove any one of these truths will be judged by God. 
one of the alarming things to notice today is the religious deception all around us. Every city in every country has its share of false prophets and deceivers. And it is important that we be able to distinguish between the true and the false. Sometimes the deception, the deviation from the truth is so subtle, so cleverly presented. The Lord said, if it be possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And he said, they shall deceive many. The inspired apostle, we've read it already, in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. Jesus told us, beware. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The word beware in Greek means hold your mind back from that thing. That's the meaning of the Greek word when it says beware. Hold back your mind. Close your mind. Pull back your mind from that idea. Don't read the tract. And don't read that book. Don't listen to that case. Hold back your mind from anything, everything coming from the false prophet. Turn from it. Flee from it. False teachers often claim to be teachers of righteousness. Such are false apostles. Receptive workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15. They are wolves wearing sheep's clothing to deceive, to destroy, to damn souls in hell. Point number three. Faithfulness to the gospel landmarks. Faithfulness to the gospel landmarks. In 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, from verse 2. And he thinks, with our side of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. As we bring everything to a conclusion, we need to understand that the gospel landmarks are serious things. And because of that, we want to make sure that we keep to the word of God. A very important gospel landmark, which I've mentioned already, is the new birth. Without it, our church members and hearers cannot see the kingdom of God. Removing this landmark, the new birth, being born again, or modifying it will lead multitudes under us to hell, and damnation. Another indispensable gospel landmark is sanctification, Christian perfection, purity of heart. Without it, we and our people may be deceived, traveling on happily, hoping to see God in the end, only to be disappointed and eternally ashamed. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Another gospel landmark that you cannot do without, that you must emphasize from time to time, is the baptism in the Holy Ghost. This is a gospel landmark which must be preached clearly and experienced scripturally. Without it, we will be impotent, powerless, weak, unable to reap the harvest of souls as we are commanded before the coming of the Lord. I need to stay literal on this baptism in the Holy Ghost and give you three points that we have to emphasize. There are people that minimize or belittle the importance of this landmark. There are others that manipulate this experience baptism in the Holy Ghost. There are others that misplace their emphasis on this 
baptism in the Holy Ghost. Some minimize. Others manipulate. Still others misplace their emphasis on the real baptism. Those who minimize and belittle the experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost, they go on toiling and laboring, preaching, working, and leading, and organizing and serving without being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And there are those of us among here, among us here, who are not baptized in the Holy Ghost, and we keep on toiling, laboring, preaching, working, doing a lot of things. We belittle that experience. We minimize that experience. We are not concerned that we are not baptized in the Holy Ghost. They walk as if they could do all that God intended for them to do without the power of the Holy Spirit. And they do not encourage or stir up members and workers in their churches to seek and to receive. We cannot accomplish half of what God ordained we should accomplish. If we are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, such people will come before God on the last day, ashamed, unable to receive a full reward too. There are those who manipulate and they deceive their people on the real experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, making the people to seek tongues instead of power, hoping or helping their people to try to speak in tongues without the anointing without the unction, without the power, without the comfort of the comforter, and without insight into scripture. There is an imitation of tongues, but the divine approval of the supernatural is missing. There are those who misplace and exaggerate the use of tongues above the power and anointed preaching through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Most of the books you find in bookshops written by Pentecostal people, most of the books, on the Holy Spirit, on the baptism, emphasizes just the speaking in tongues. And sometimes you'll find a book that tells you 30 reasons why you must speak in tongues. Other people will tell you answers to 20, 30 objections to speaking in tongues. Other people will tell you how to speak in tongues uh, instantly. Other people will show you seven steps to speaking in tongues. Other people bring testimonies. Everything is concentrated on speaking in tongues. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. What's the use of speaking in tongues without being able to witness? Without having the power for service? without having the insight into scripture was the use of speaking in tongues without that holy spirit the spirit of truth guiding you into all truth you find a lot of people speaking in tongues they cannot differentiate sound doctrine from false doctrine that's not a real experience when the holy spirit is resident within the spirit of truth you know what it will do? It will guide you into all truth. You find a person that speaks in tongues, he has quiet time in the morning, he doesn't know how to take any nourishing value of the word of God from that Bible unto himself. He doesn't know the Bible. And he, doesn't, he does not identify sound doctrine. He does not have the real power to be able to know that this is the power of God. When he preaches, when he witnesses, when he evangelizes, you see that his words are valueless. Only speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues. You see those people misplace. They misplace. They're speaking in tongues. If you read, there is no time. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 to 19, in verse 19 in particular, Paul, the inspired apostle, he said by the Holy Ghost, he said he would rather speak five words in an understandable language in the church, in the church, than speak 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now if you think of that, if you speak 200 words a minute, you will speak 10,000 words in 50 minutes. It takes just less than five seconds to speak five words. So Paul the Apostle is saying it's more important in the church to speak five words 
in one second than to speak in tongues for about one hour in a language that is not understood. You see, there are some people that like to demonstrate how full of the Holy Ghost they are. They come over the pulpit and they're speaking in tongues from the pulpit so that everybody can hear and so that the people who are seeking to be baptized in the Holy Ghost can copy that speaking in tongues and pick that same thing up and say, I'm speaking in tongues, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. Where is the power? Where is the comfort? Where is the insight? Was the revelation of Christ. We need to understand that the word of God does not exalt speaking in tongues to so that high level. When it says, I rather speak five words, five words, than speak in tongues in 10,000 words. Can you, do you have examples of those five words, important words? Remove not the old landmarks. Those are five words. I rather speak those five words. Preach those five words, interpret those five words, emphasize those five words, remove not the old landmarks, five words, and preach it, emphasize it, explain it to the understanding of the people, and take one hour to be speaking in tongues. Five words, ye must be born again. Five words. I rather speak those five words, emphasize those five words, and make sure the people, they understand those five words, ye must be born again. And then, they will be able to understand the reality of Christianity. Five words, go and sin no more. Rather stay with those five words. Rather preach on those five words. In, the, in your understanding that the people will recognize what it means to stand and to live a righteous life. Five words, let no man deceive you. Five words. And Paul the Apostle said it will be better in the church. You speak five words to the understanding of the people rather than just demonstrating speaking in tongues. Five words sanctify them through thy truth. Five words. Be filled with the spirit. Five words. Content for the faith. Content for the faith. Five words. Then watch thou in all things. It were better for us in the church to emphasize those five words, watch thou in all things, or to emphasize, do all things without murmurings, or to emphasize, feed the church of God. Just five words in their understanding that will build the church, that will edify the church. Take heed to the ministry, five words. Speak evil of no man. Five words. Prepare to meet thy God. Five words. Hold fast till I come. Five words. The harvest truly is plenteous. Five words. Here am I. Send me. Five words. The Lord is at hand. Five words. If you emphasize those five words that emphasize, that emphasize the word of God, the teaching of the Bible, the lifestyle of the people, you'll be doing a lot of good. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. We've been on in this conference, this congress, now for almost a week. And here we come to the climax. That we should keep to the old landmarks, even though we're in modern times. And it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Will you do it? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort without long suffering. And doctrine is there a purpose in your heart to defend the landmarks that God has set up in his word God's word will still be standing when the stars have faded away get on the right side put your confidence in the word of God that has stood the test of time and will stand through all eternity your attitude so the totality, the completement of the old landmarks will determine your eternal destiny. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer.
the old landmarks.